father of global warming because you were among the first, or possibly the first, to actually alert us to this disaster in our midst. Uh, you formerly at NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Studies, uh, now adjunct professor at the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences at Columbia University. Yes, I know the lighting here is a bit strange. Uh, you get used to it after a bit. And you've just published another study with 16 other leading experts on the rising levels uh, of sea, sea levels, uh, rising faster than people think. So I'm looking forward to your PowerPoint. Um, you will have about 10 minutes mm -hmm. uh, to tell us a little bit about your new uh, wake-up policies for Europe and the world. And then I'm going to join you here on stage and grill you with a few questions. So I'll say bye-bye for a minute. And okay. Thank you. okay, thanks very much. <clears throat> I'm going to use some charts that I used last evening uh, in Oslo. Uh, <laughs> because I really would like to um, bring unrest after what I just heard from the back of the room. Uh, I, I think we really need some unrest. Um, let's see if this will work. How do I move that? There we go. You know, I'm, I'm going to be critical. I, uh, I, in Oslo, I was critical of the Norwegian government. I'm going to be critical of Europe, uh, but I will admit, I, I want to make clear. Well, I'll tell you what it says. I'll, yeah, I'll tell you what it says. What it says is that now, on the left, China has become the big emitter. However, it's not today's emissions that cause climate change. It's the total emissions over time. We've shown that the climate uh, change is accurately proportional to the integrated emissions because the carbon stays in the system for millennia. And in that case, the United States is responsible for more than a quarter of the climate change. European Union is also responsible for more than a quarter. And China for 10 percent, India for 3 percent, and so on. But in the future, you know, you see what's happening. China's emissions are going up, and they're mostly coal. India, the same story. It's mostly coal, and emissions are rising rapidly. So then we get statements like this, somewhat similar to what I was hearing in the last half hour. Okay, so the optimism about Paris. Why are they optimistic? Well, the thing that he mentions is, oh, Carbon capture and storage. We've agreed to cooperate with China on carbon capture and storage. So we're optimistic about Paris. This is pure, unadulterated, 100% pure bullshit. <laughs> Chi China and India are not going to capture the carbon coming off from their, their steel mills and heavy industry, and, and uh, they're making our products. We burn fossil fuels. It makes it much more expensive if you're going to try to capture the CO2. And where are you going to put it? They're not going to do that. You're, you're just kidding yourself if you think uh, that that technology is going to be used uh, by those countries in any reasonable time frame. Uh, for that, so that's one reason that uh, my oldest grandchild, Sophie, who's sitting beside me there, and I have uh, filed a lawsuit against uh, President Obama and the uh, United States government for not doing their job uh, and violating the fundamental rights of young people. They have, according to our Constitution, they have equal rights for life, liberty, and property in pursuit of happiness, including uh, property, which cannot be uh, taken away without due process of law. But that's exactly what we're doing. We're screwing them. We're assuring that they're going to have a declining lifestyle by just ignoring the climate problem and pretending that we're doing something, like I heard in the last half hour. The fundamental fact is that the climate system responds slowly. 
So we've only felt a fraction of the climate change, of the impacts due to the climate change that uh, for the gas is already up there. So we have to reduce emissions very rapidly if we want to uh, keep a climate that's looked like the one of the last 10,000 years. It's actually possible, and it actually makes economic sense. But nobody's talking about it. No government has proposed it, and I sure didn't hear it in the last half hour. The main uh, problems, are, the things that are most serious, in my opinion, are those that are irreversible. And that means uh, extermination of species. We can make 25 to 50 percent of them uh, uh, committed to extinction by the end of the century if we stay on the fossil fuel path that we're on. And ice sheet disintegration and sea level rise, it takes tens of thousands of years for an ice sheet to be built. And we are, it, it, an example is the coral reefs, which are the rainforest of the ocean more than a million species associated with them. We're losing more than 1% a year. We've already lost a substantial fraction of them. And because of ocean acidification and warming, we, we are threatening uh, most of those species. Uh, and, it, and it's usually a combination. We're, we're just sort of taking over the planet. And the combination of shifting climate zones with the other stresses uh, is what threatens uh, the species. Now, with regard to ice sheet and sea level, you know, we can see that the ice sheets are beginning to lose mass more and more rapidly uh, because of the warming. Uh, and, you know, the ice sheet modelers had said, well, we calculate uh, sea level may go up a couple of meters. Then they, but then, uh, if you look at the Earth's history, you know that the last time it was two degrees warmer, sea level, the last time it was one degree warmer, 120,000 years ago, sea level was at least six meters higher. If you go one degree warmer than that, it was 20 meters higher. Well, now they changed their model and included hydrofracturing and cliff failure. This is not rock, this is ice, and it's not. <laughs> and uh, then the two meters became 20 meters. So the ice sheet model, so you have to really look at the Earth's history, and it tells us that the system is very sensitive. It takes time, but we're in danger of handing our children a system in which they're guaranteed sea level rise of several meters. That means all coastal cities become dysfunctional. The and more than half of the world's largest cities are on coastlines. So the economic consequences of that are incalculable. If we allow that to happen, and we're getting very close to guaranteeing that it will happen, uh, we're handing that situation to young people. Now, um, and, well, okay, and their entire nations like Bangladesh would, would disappear as long as, in addition to the Netherlands and Florida, uh, but, so, what are we talking about? What are people talking about? I heard the words emission trading scheme. You know, it's basically, it's the Kyoto Protocol approach. Pretend that you can have caps. Uh, this is, pardon my crude language, but it's half, it's half assed and it's half baked. It's half assed because you can't make, there's no way to make it global. And there's no enforcement mechanism. So uh, why are we kidding ourselves to think that if we do this experiment again, it's going to come out with a different result? Emissions accelerated after the Kyoto Protocol was introduced. The problem is that fossil fuels are the cheapest energy. That's why we use them. That's why they're providing more than 85% of our energy because they uh, seem to be the cheapest energy, but that's because they don't have to pay. First of all, they're partially subsidized in many places, and then they don't have to pay for the costs of pollution, air pollution and water pollution. If your child gets asthma, you pay the bill, not the fossil fuel company. It's not included in the price. And the climate impacts are not included. So we should add a rising fee to... Uh, to fossil fuels, which requires, you can't get 190 nations to agree to a common rising fee, but you don't need to. There are only three big players, European Union, United States, and China. 
two out of the three have got to agree. And from what I just heard, we're down to two players. You have to get the U.S. and China to agree to have a carbon fee. And it's not that difficult. You, you, what you would have to do is collect a fee at the domestic mine or the port of entry. There are only a small number of places to collect it. And if you then distribute the money to the public, an equal amount to every legal resident of the country, the person who does better than average in limiting their fossil fuel use will make money. And, but if they want to stay on the positive side of that ledger, they're going to have to pay attention to their carbon footprint. And it's very easy to do. All they have to do is look at the prices of the things they buy. Because the prices of things that are, uh, the things that are using fossil fuels will become more expensive. So that's a transparent approach, and it's, it's a conservative approach. That's the only way you're going to get conservative governments to go along. And I've talked to conservatives in the United States. Behind the scenes, they're willing to say, a revenue-neutral carbon tax, which becomes not a tax, it doesn't give any money to the government, doesn't make the government bigger, they're willing to do that. But you have, to, you have to get liberals to propose that. Instead, liberals are proposing stupid emission trading schemes, which they know don't work. Uh, so, it, but in fact, if you have a carbon fee and distribute the money to the public, you know, it is, it is progressive. Rich people who have traveled around the world or have big houses will lose money, but they can afford that to pay that. But, you're put, but the low-income people who will spend the money, it turns out when you do economic studies, it actually stimulates the economy. It does not uh, depress the economy. It actually stimulates it if you do it that way. But if you steal the money and say, oh, I'm going to use the money for this, you give it to the government, then it, depress, then it becomes a tax, and it depresses the economy. And it's the only viable international approach. You only need two out of the three big players to agree to do it. And then you would say, we're putting a border duty on products from countries that do not have an equivalent carbon fee. That's a huge incentive for them to have their own carbon fee so they can collect the money themselves rather than have us collect it at the border. There's only one country, there's one country which actually completely decarbonized their electricity. That was Sweden. They still have a carbon footprint because they didn't decarbonize their vehicles. They still burn uh, petrol. But uh, if you have carbon-free electricity, the problem is solved. We, can, we know how to make liquid fuels from energy. We, could, we don't have to keep burning oil if we have abundant, affordable electricity. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, this is al I'm almost to the end. Uh, I don't think we should scare young people by telling them there's a global warming problem. So I don't do that. I, I try to introduce my grandchildren to nature. But unfortunately, I didn't realize when I gave a talk in a neighbor's backyard that my oldest grandson, uh, uh, Connor, was, was in the audience. And at the end of my talk, my wife noticed there were tears running down his face. And she said, oh, don't worry, Connor. Adults are working on this. They're, the adults are going to solve this problem. Uh, well, I, I hope she's right. But Connor, Connor was eight years old at that time. But now he's 11 years old. And uh, a, a month or so ago, he wrote something for uh, his school. What he wrote was, you know, that we can ruin the planet unless we can figure out how to make a time machine that actually works. Well, it's not fair that grown-ups are ruining the atmosphere for the grown-up in the future. Grown-ups now are scared of nuclear power, but they should be scared what will happen if they keep doing what they're doing now because we know that we know ways to use nuclear power safe, and we know that using fossil fuels is not safe. It's very dangerous. And just as an example, we, know how, we knew how 50 years ago to build thorium-powered molten salt reactors, which operate at atmospheric pressure, so you cannot have an explosion like at uh, Fukushima. 
and which uh, uh, burn 99% of the energy instead of six tenths of 1% of the energy, so which, you know, our present nuclear technology leaves almost all of the energy in a waste pile with a 10,000 year lifetime. So you've got to babysit it forever. But that, the reason that uh, was chosen was the United States military wanted plutonium for, nu for weapons. And so they tr uh, the military leaders persuaded uh, the U.S. government to go that technology route. But we, don't, but we know how now to do much better uh, technology, which uh, uh, also you know, operates at atmospheric pressure. So anyway, uh, so I think I'm done. Yes, uh, thank you. That was great. I do want to thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Certainly lived up to your reputation. I think a lot of us uh, uh, expected exactly that from you, a wake-up call for the Europeans and perhaps for other countries uh, here as well. Um, you've been pretty harsh about the EU. Uh, do you think leading up to Paris and beyond, this is a completely useless exercise, Paris? Completely something that we no, shouldn't be doing? Uh, no, no, it's not, it's, uh, it's not useless, but you shouldn't pretend. That, uh, that any solution has been obtained. And it, why are we not willing to talk about a carbon fee? Yeah, you know, you, as, it, it's as fundamental as the law of gravity. As long as you allow fossil fuels to be the cheapest energy, somebody will keep burning them. So you can't cap, you cap something, but if the fossil fuels are cheap, somebody else will burn it. You know, so that's, what is the cap on India? There, India is not agreeing to a cap. So you know very well the fossil fuels will, so what we have, the reason we filed a suit against uh, Obama and the government is he says on the one hand, we have a planet in peril. And on the other hand, he approves offshore drilling, drilling on public lands, fracking to get gas, fracking to get oil, you look and, you know, it's reducing the use of coal a bit, but sending more of it overseas. So, and you know very well that's, <laughs> that's not solving the problem. So, there's, it's schizophrenic. You can't pretend that you're solving the problem. And that's, but we're kidding ourselves. I hear too many people kidding themselves. They really think Oh, when uh, solar panels are becoming cheaper, so we're solving the problem. Well, it will reduce emissions uh, somewhat, but look at Germany. They're working like, they've got the best engineers in the world, and they're working very hard, and yet they're building coal-fired power plants powered by the dirtiest coal on the planet, and they're selling that coal to other places. So it's, it's a sham. And they're kidding themselves if they think uh, that they're solving the problem. So you're saying basically, Jim, no step by step. What is then the magic bullet, the magic wand that you would wave? Well, the fundamental requirement is this is a, is a rising carbon fee. And if you give it, to, if you give the money to the public, they will support this because two thirds of the people with the present distribution of energy use in the European Union or the United States, two-thirds of the people would get more in the dividend than they pay in increased prices. So that's the fundamental requirement. But as far as technological bullets, bullets uh, silver bullets, there's not a single one. But I, I do think that China and India, there's no way that they can get off of coal without the help of nuclear power. And we burned their share of the carbon budget. So we have a moral obligation to help them find, an, and we have a practical obligation for our own sake to f help them find a way to have the energy to make our products and to, uh, and to raise their people out of poverty. If we don't help them with an alternative, they're going to use the same way that we did, burn fossil fuels. And we do know one alternative, and that's advanced, safe nuclear power. And for us to 
let this quasi-religion, uh, you know, every day more than 10,000 people die from these small particles in the atmosphere which are, are produced by fossil fuel burning. World Health Organization, you know, has documented this. That's more in one day than have been killed in history by nuclear power. But because of this quasi-religion, uh, people are deathly afraid of nuclear power, even though the particles that are coming off from fossil fuel burning are actually much uglier, <laughs> if you look at them under a microscope, than, um, than uh, radiation. Uh, anyway. Uh, Jim, you talked about China, and we know that uh, fossil fuels are big also in China, but you seem to be quite uh, upbeat about what China is doing in terms of uh, meeting its climate change uh, responsibilities. I'm upbeat in terms of them, their leaders being objective. And they, they would not, I think they, you know, it, it should, it's not black and white. They, they can, you, they're even introducing some emission trading, which will help reduce emissions within China a little bit. But at the same time, they know that they have to actually phase out fossil fuels. And, that, and so they're, and they're planning to introduce nuclear power. They will, they will do uh, solar and, and wind, beca partly because it allows them to sell. They, they, will get the, they will be able to build them cheaper than we do, and so they'll be able to sell it. And that's really why, why they started doing it. But, but they also are, are going to, uh, you know, I'm organizing a workshop there in December, uh, which is on air pollution and climate, but it's also, it's got the best nuclear experts in the world because China is very eager to develop safe nuclear power. When uh, you talked about the lawsuit, you also talked about the importance of young people. Are you, are you working very closely with young people to try and get this message across? And I wonder, when you talk about nuclear energy to young people, what kind of reaction do you get? Because there is a big uh, anti-nuclear movement within young people and among many, many uh, countries, yeah, as you said, a religion. Yeah, well, th maybe, maybe it's different in uh, Europe. I, I, I don't have certainly not met that. On the contrary, on college campuses, it's, it's uh, the majority of uh, students are supportive of nuclear power. And that's, and it's too bad that our governments are not, you know, we actually have several startup nuclear efforts in the U.S., but <laughs> in the U.S., you got to plunk down a billion dollars before you can take a design to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. You know, it's, it, it, the government is not uh, supportive of new ideas and new technologies. Uh, so I, the, the hope is that young people and there will help to lead in technological developments like that. Thank you. Um, I'm ready to take uh, one or two questions from the floor for you, Jim, because we still have some time. So please, uh, if you could raise your hands. Yes, I see a hand right at the back. And perhaps, uh, David, you said you would like to come in and talk about, just say a few words about uh, fossil fuel subsidies as well. So yes, please, please Hi. identify yourself and keep it really short, please. Yes, uh, my name is Peter Viss. I work in the European Commission and Jim, what you said is confusing, and you're, to some extent, you're making a very powerful case for action. But then you're saying that an instrument, emissions trading, that we use in Europe is ineffective. That is very unhelpful because it is working slowly, and it's going to work tomorrow. You're like a health coach who's going to tell me, Peter, you should go on a marathon tomorrow. I'm not ready for that. We're going to incrementally get ready for a marathon. Right and we're gonna get ready for emissions trading, and it is working in Europe. There is enforcement, and there are penalties well, for Thanks companies. for the question. Europe, in Europe. This is not a European problem. It's a global problem. What is the cap on India? Tell me what the, how your emission trading scheme is going to reduce India's emissions. That's where the emissions are coming. That's where the CO2 is coming from. You have to have a scheme that will work globally, and the only, <laughs> And the fundamental fact is you've got to have a, a price, you've got to make the 
cost of fossil fuels honest. What you're saying is we're doing it within the European Union. European Union is no longer the big issue. So you're solving a problem which is not the problem. I think you'll take one more, one more question. There was a hand that went up here. Yes, sorry, yes. Very quickly, Mark. So, thank you. Mark Johnston again. Um, the science narrative is not in dispute. We are heading for a crash, um, for sure, but we, we, which we perceive is happening in slow motion. Um, uh, in reality, it's not. But we still have to organize a response. So, how should we organize those responses? Um, do you regard democracy and the democracies that we live in as a hurdle to organizing responses? Um, or okay. would you prefer still to live in a democracy? And okay. I'm thinking in particular the situation where yeah. the US Congress today is more or less sold out to the highest bidder. Thank okay. you. Okay, thanks, Mark. Yeah, so that's very much to the point. Uh, we, we have to work within democracy, and what we're trying to do in the United States, and it's now spread to a few other countries, is an organization called Citizens Climate Lobby, which has this sole objective of getting the government to adopt carbon fee and dividend, as I described. Um, and we're making progress. So actually, we, we got the, the liberals, Barbara Boxer introduced a bill, carbon fee and dividend, but she wanted 40% of the money and said, we'll give 60% of the money to the public and we'll use 40% to reduce the national debt, which means you're throwing it in the government's pot and the conservatives will never agree with this. Then it's a tax, and it depresses the economy. So we, we're fighting that, and this organization has doubled in size each year for the last four years. It's beginning to be heard, uh, but we have to, we're working behind the scenes with conservatives, because it really has to come from conservatives. We can't get liberals to change their stripes. But eventually, they ha that's where they have to compromise. The liberals are going to have to say, okay, we're not going to steal it for making the government bigger. And the conservatives are going to, the conservatives that I've met say, oh, we want to use that to reduce some taxes that we don't like. That's not going to work. Uh, you have to actually give the money to the public. Uh, so, but the w reason to be optimistic is the other big player, China, is not a democracy. And they can impose, if they decide, if they understand that a carbon fee is actually to their benefit uh, to solve the air pollution problem. And, I, and I'm trying to persuade them that it actually will help if you actually give the money to the public, because the public is getting very unhappy there mm -hmm. about the air pollution. It's very bad. And if the public would start to feel, oh, we're part of the solution, because if we, we can get this dividend, if we do well in reducing our emissions, then we actually make money and we'll be part of the solution to this air pollution problem. I, th I think it would work there. Mm -hmm. So you got to work it in both the democracy and the, and the non-democracy. Non non-democracies. David Taylor, please. Just put up your hand, David. Can we get a microphone here, please? It's the final question. Uh, it's not really a question, it's a comment, Shada. I'm David Taylor, New Zealand ambassador to the EU and also, for my sins, a former climate negotiator. Um, I was at the uh, first COP in Berlin 20 years ago. Um, I just want to come back to the fossil fuel subsidy question which came up in Jim's remarks and was also yeah. the focus of a question before. Um, and to say that there are about $600 billion worth of subsidies being spent every year by governments around the world on fossil, on fossil fuel subsidies. We do need to get off that uh, addiction, as Jim said. Uh, about 31 countries so far have committed to reducing and phasing out those subsidies. Uh, it's easier now than it has been because oil prices are lower, so the shock of reducing the subsidies is less than it was. There are therefore fiscal benefits from reducing the subsidies, and there's also a health benefit, coming back to the point Jim made about the 10,000 people a day losing their lives because of particulates. Um, Paris is important uh, in this sense. It's not in the form of negotiating stuff, as, as Yana said, but we and a number of other countries called the Friends of Fossil Fuel Subsidy Reform, and there's a website about that you can look at, um, are pushing to get... Uh, a communique launched in Paris which will commit countries to taking further action on this question. Uh, nine EU members have signed up already as, as in support of that, uh, including uh, France, UK, um, Germany, so three of the biggest ones and a number of others. Um, so we're hoping that will go ahead. Uh, it will be launched at a high level. Our Prime Minister and other leaders will be involved in it. 
Um, so I just want to say, put that on the table and say that was uh, really um, important. Thanks, David. Yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, yeah. Any uh, comments on yeah, that? Yeah, re reducing subsidies is a very good thing to try to do and re removing them. But the only, but it's very difficult. It's like the aviation thing. You know, they introduced uh, no tax on aviation fuel half a century ago, and then it's hard to remove subsidies once you've given them. So one thing that just covers them, a, f a fee across the board, rising fee, just will wipe out, in effect, all the subsidies. Thank you very much indeed, Jim. It's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you for your questions as well, and uh, we hope to see you soon. And I hope that you know, things work out the way you want it uh, and not the way that we think may happen. <laughs> Thank you very much.